Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this Cray live stream. My name is Mike Boyle, and we are very blessed to have a cast of panelists here that uh, will be able to talk about some very intriguing com components tied to the subject of the circular economy within construction. But before we actually go ahead and allow for our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves, I have, I've been joking with the panelists that I have a surprise. And so now, of course, is the time to unveil the surprise. I'd like to welcome you all from beautiful downtown Dessau. Now, I have a question for all of you, and I would like you to go ahead and Put the, the, your answer within the comments box. Now, there's something that Dessau is very famous for, and I would like you to go ahead and put that straight in the, in the comments box. So let's go ahead and see what kind, and I let our panelists go ahead and think about it, but please, if you know, you don't have to go ahead and, um, and spoil the surprise. Let's see if we have any comments coming from the comments box. It usually takes about 30 seconds based on my experience before people actually go ahead and type something in, and by the time it, it actually goes ahead and appears. And I hope my panels are all doing good today. Uh, maybe what we'll do, just to make sure that everything's in a, a smooth fashion, I'll um, allow for the panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. And of course, as we should always follow decorum, then we definitely need to go ahead and make sure it's ladies first. So Alexa, if you could go mm -hmm. ahead and tell us a little bit about it yourself. Thank you so much. Yeah, my name is Alexa Lutzenberger. Nice greetings from a warm summer day here of, uh, out of Hamburg. It's uh, just beautiful weather here. It's great. Um, yeah, what I'm doing, I'm head of uh, Resco. It's a company um, that, is, uh, that makes certif uh, certification of buildings, uh, focusing on um, uh, climate change, the resource change we have to make, and also the the change in the energy supply we are still working on worldwide. So that is what I'm doing. I came out of the um, scientific field. I was working more than 15 years at university in, in research. And uh, yeah, it's nice to produce uh, research uh, papers and so on, but I switched now into the economy because I really wanted to change something. And I think, um, now, my, um, the effect of my work is much higher than before. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that the timing has uh, changed. If I think about the, the general momentum that we have today in comparison to a couple of years ago, I think that um, your timing is, is spot on, Alexa. I agree. Bjorn, perhaps if we can continue with you. Sure, it's B after A. Yeah, hello, Bjorn is my name. I'm sending out of uh, Munich. Uh, it's also sunny here, not just in Hamburg, also in Munich. And I'm a strategy consultant uh, for, say, quarter decade, so basically 25 years in business and working and focusing on the construction sector only along the full value chain. So we work a lot for suppliers of different building material, also pre-manufactured pre uh, buildings and, and elements but also others, let's say HVAC and, and other, let's say products that go into buildings, residential to large commercial buildings. We work for the distribution value chain. So all, all the way, let's say professional distributors, um, construction firms, but uh, also facility managing firms uh, down to the last element in the value chain, that's the investors and owners, so housing firms and, and the like. So that's the field we, we play in. and. Uh, I only produce paper, uh, Alexa, not uh, uh, not direct action, but uh, we recommend our clients a lot, uh, also investors to buy or sell. Uh, we can also move things from from that theoretic the theoretical paper end. So that's that's uh, my field of of interest, and very happy to contribute with uh, some trends and observations we have from that sector. Back to you, Mike. All right, wonderful, Bjorn. Thank you very much. Let's can go ahead and continue with Puya. Puya, please, the stage is yours. Uh, good, good morning from Toronto. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Puya Bactus from uh, literally hot summer day in Toronto, and uh, I'm a co-founder of the Partisans a Design Platform in Toronto. And um, as as I said, we we. Uh, 
through our name partisans, we see ourselves as most of a platform that start collaborating in various kind of aspects of design from beginning from policy making to design to delivery and construction. Um, and uh, we've been working with various projects from small scale to large urban design. And I'm glad to be here. Yep, and we are glad that you're here as well, Puya. Thank you. And then lastly, Hubert, perhaps if you could introduce yourself, please. Yeah, I'm Hubert. Uh, I'm I'm uh, stepping in from Bregenz, Austria, right at the German-Swiss border in the heart of Europe. Um, I'm a master builder uh, from the technical coming from the technical side. I I'm I'm the fourth generation in leading this this group of uh, construction companies of our family. Um, I started '99 in this company. 2003, I made a new strategy when I took over the management, and it was all about sustainability. But at that time, it was just something awkward, and everyone was like, "What, what the hell is he talking about?" And you know. And then I met Bio Schmidt Blake, which is quite important for me. Uh, uh, this 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 great man, uh, um, because he. He was really the first person looking at the material in in all aspects, in aspects of our society, of our business, our flow. You know, all our activities are a flow of material. So, short story, a long story short. So he was talking about factor X. We have to dematerialize whatever we do by factor 10. And then I was thinking about myself, how could I change a whole construction company to go down on factor 10 resource? That's why we started a lot of research and stuff. And then we tried in 2008 to build wooden structures because the lowest, less volume, low rucksack, uh, and to make it circular. So we came up with a wood hybrid structure out of our research. That was the point of, in time where I started Cree as a company um, and I hope Cree will grow as fast. We're accelerating now at the moment like exponentially because of the demand of green building, demand of resource efficiency, demand of circularity, data, digital. That's all what Cree is. So talking about material and circularity is what I love most. So I'm happy to be part of you guys. No, here. and uh, <laughs> of course, that's what we plan to uh, pack our live stream with. And to get back to my original question, so what is Dasso famous for? Uh, Wolfgang uh, was able to go ahead and guess that. It's the Bauhaus School of Design. And I think it's very appropriate for our conversation today, especially if we understand the concept that bad input leads to bad output. And then just piggybacking that on who, but what you were talking about earlier. And so looking from a personal perspective, I believe that regenerative design in the beginning is imperative for us to make progress. But of course, that's all easier said than done that perhaps, Hubert, if you can go ahead and uh, give us your thoughts tied to this idea of how do we go ahead and anchor this in the beginning of the process so that we don't have to go ahead and clean up the mess <laughs> based on that take, make, dispose process that we know all too well. Yeah, thanks for the question. Here comes my standard answer, which um, I give mostly to politicians or whoever said, what can we do to make this change? And I say, the easiest thing to do would be normally if you get approval for a building, you have to send the documents, the drawings and the documents you send to authority. Okay. So instead of just getting those, the designs ask for a material list and a disassembly manual. Just those two things, okay? That would change everything because all the designers, whoever is working on the project, would have to think in advance, oh, what's in there, what kilos of what material is in there with what embodied carbon, rucksack, whatever. So they would have to make a list. And how would I build it back when I build it back in 80 years? Because with that information, like an iterative process, you would just design it differently. So thinking about the digital twin, which is able, we are able to do today, uh, no, not 10 years ago, but today, uh, in a digital twin, you can, you can have the data for every part of this building, like Lego style. With every part, there's data, 
what's the weight, what's the material, what's the cost, what's the deliver time of delivery. So out of that digital twin, you can even make a time plan to build the building. So it's all about data and transparency. And if you are an investor, and that will change with investors, they want to have green investment. So if you buy a building, like a hundred million building, for instance, Rob 50, you will not take the, this without the data relating to the building. It's like you buy a huge chunk of garbage you don't know at the end, like trash, how to get that back, how to handle it because you don't have the information. So I think that will change a lot that w the, w those who have the power and those are mostly those who have the money and order, they will make the change. And then the industry has to change really fast because the demand side will change much faster than the supply side is able to change their processes. So that will make the big change I see in the next couple of years. It's Great. Different. Thanks for that. And I'm sure that the our other three panelists would have some comments. I see Puna smiling already. So I think he's already stand, he's already in the um, he's in the waiting room ready to go ahead and, and piggyback who about on what you said. P Puya, perhaps if you give us your thoughts on that. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I think in the construction industry, perhaps like a, one of the kind of uh, it's the oldest and uh, to be honest, it's the kind of slowest industry compared to like the automobile, uh, uh, aerospace, ship, even ship making. Uh, and then in the course, uh, as an architect, I think the problem becomes that we've seen every, uh, it, our business based on the project base rather than on product base. It means like every project we comes like start from the scratch, go to the approval, um, find a contractor, subcontractors, um, um, building on, um, uh, use the kind of unskilled workers on site, a lot of them temporary. So there is no accountability, there's no system. And then uh, I think there are a couple of things that can be shared. Uh, and uh, the first one, I think, is looking in kind of architecture as a product rather than a project um, that, that leads to a standardization. And when you look at what, as Hubert said, when you talk about the, that product, then everything gets a kind of a, uh, each material or even process of construction become a, 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 like a system assembly that would have a life cycle on it, uh, similar to the, any piece of the kind of cars or any piece of airplane. And if you see the kind of building as a kind of rather than building as a monument that's supposed to last forever, you see it as a kind of a process or system. It can be changed, refurbished, updated, um, uh, and uh, perhaps kind of uh, seeing it kind of, I'm adding it all, I became very kind of, uh, kind of interested in uh, was kind of, we, we keep talking about that uh, assembly process. We should talk about the assembly process too. So what happened when the building reached the end of the time, how easily you can take it out without damaging the environment um, and how you can use those, the assembly to build something new uh, so I think that's kind of uh, um, kind of make me excited about the, kind of the circular economy and circular building uh, that the SMB. Well, I can tell you, I would love to banish the world word demolition from the English yeah. language if that was at all possible. Uh, <laughs> Bjorn, Alex, any thoughts from your side with regards to this idea of circular uh, design or regenerative design? I Next think there are two, there are two, two aspects, um, I think about. The, f the first aspect is, and that's it, exactly what my, my company is, is doing, um, that we are working together with the architects in, in a very early planning phase. Um, and then we can um, take a look on all the materials that they want to use. And um, I can give them the information about the resource input abiotic, so the ecological rucksack, for example. I can give them uh, information about um, the uh, global warming potential of all these materials. So they have the chance to change, to change the materials, to, to take other materials that have less impact on the climate, tra climate change, for example. This is one big issue. The other point is, I think, we all think, um, when, we had, when we take a look on the building, we think it's a complex thing. That's one, one, one construct. But I think, um, when, when, also, when we are uh, building now with, for example, with, um, with timber or a timber hybrid or anything else, 
I have a fundament, I have a cellar, for example, and this is normally concrete. Um, then I have uh, the stage, uh, the stages, and, and so it's concrete too. But, but all the other stuff I can make out of timber, for example. And then I have different lifetimes of different parts of the buildings. And I think this could be extremely interesting because the cellar, the fundament that could hold, for example, 200 years and the facade maybe have to be made new after 30 years. And I think we have to, 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 to split the complexity of this building out. And then we have a lot of more possibilities to think and, and to think about it on, on, on the construction side in the first beginning. Mm. planning phase. Excellent. Björn, please. Yeah, I think to add to all what has been said, uh, so we clearly see, let's say, huge growth rates in, in prefab buildings. And uh, yeah. let's say the, the share of, of that segment is really growing fast. I think Hubert is, is on spot with uh, Cree. And I think he mentioned already uh, two drivers. So what has not been the driver in the past is people talking green. I mean, people talk green, but as soon as they need to invest money, they're, they're a bit more traditional and are not really change, uh, driving the change. But what really helped a lot is, uh, I think, the political discussion in, the, on the, in Brussels, in Europe here, and also on, on, in the different countries. So Germany quite being back in this game. Of course, there is the election coming. So the, the legal framework is really changing a lot. And I also like to see the rising uh, carbon uh, prices that people have to pay. So I think there is something coming and, and people realize. An even stronger driver is, is the financing. So Huber totally on spot, uh, basically the investors and, and the green funds uh, driving uh, and changing their portfolios going forward. I think that is a perfect driver. And another driver that has not been mentioned yet is, is simply efficiency. I think the scarcity of resources. So we have not enough uh, people to build the buildings that, that are needed. So the demand is just fantastic. I mean, in the past, we thought, oh, my God, it's a cyclical sector so after long let's say high phases that we have seen or observed so far there will be de de decades of decline again but i don't see that so there is so much demand in renovation and also new build but there are simply not enough people doing that so um, doing construction sites as traditionally is simply the wrong way so increasing the efficiency and simply using that kind of technology to build more and and build better and build cheaper even sometimes. So the price is uh, still something for discussion. Uh, cement is so cheap and steel, So, but that will change. I think those are the key drivers that really will, uh, let's say, make those uh, three digit, uh, let's say growth rates also, let's say, uh, something for the future. So that's, I would say, what really changes and not just in five years, it has started already. And uh, we, we, we probably see, uh, so we have seen this in the residential ready, ready, uh, let's say, made houses already for years. I think growth rates always have been double uh, as, as the traditional building technology. In commercial, it's now really picking up. And also in Europe, we have seen this in Asia for quite a while, but in Europe, it's now also picking up. And I really look very much forward. It's a lot of education. And at the end, it's the architects, it's the planners, it's the investors that really need to be educated about the advantages of, of that technology. And that's something I expect, let's say, every day. So it's, it's, I think we have this discussion exactly at the right time point and hopefully a lot of listeners and good comments on that. What a great segue, Bjorn. Thank you very much for mentioning the listeners because I have a whole backlog back here of all kinds of questions to go ahead and post you. But I, we want to make sure that the session is as interactive as possible. So that means all of you who are out there currently watching, please feel empowered to go ahead and put your questions into the chat box and we will do our best to ensure that your questions are answered by our esteemed panelists. But maybe to give you an opportunity to warm up a little bit before you um, go ahead and pose that question, let me go ahead and come up with a, a few from my own. I, we talked about new buildings for the most part. Bjorn, you did mention uh, refurbishment, but if we look at the one of the biggest problems we have, apart from the fact that 25% of the, our CO2 footprint is actually coming out of buildings in some fashion, that means we have a whole slew of existing buildings that are out there that need to be addressed. So would anybody have any thoughts on perhaps maybe a checklist of how we can actually go ahead and approach that? There's money to be uh, 
accrued from Brussels. That's very clear from Franz Timmermans because he keeps talking about the subject himself. Any thoughts from our esteemed panelist? Please feel free. Okay, Alexa. Yeah. So I think at, at the end, it, it's, it's the same um, how we t uh, take a look on, on new buildings because uh, it's a question of the material we use. And it's a question of uh, how much of, of uh, um, the old old building substance uh, could be used, um, and and what what are we we uh, uh, include in these old buildings, and uh, and how and how we do it. And this is also again a question of of uh, the chosen material, and um, and the impacts of these materials on on the earths. Mm -hmm. It's very easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? Hubert, you're smiling, so I think you have something to contribute. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, as a construction company, I always say, I mean, it's strange because I always say the most sustainable thing is not to build, okay? Think about a solution where you don't have to build new, okay? So second, if that's not possible, and that's coming to your question, reuse built environment. So how can we, like, refurbish and, and, and in a way that it's, it's again lasting a very long time because time is always very important having in mind uh, um, when we talk about sustainability. That's why I always say architecture, good, great architecture is the best way of sustainability because people will never tear it down because they love it. Okay, so it, it will it will sustain and will be there. It's very important to say that because some say, oh, you're talking about prefabrication and efficiency and where's the architecture? I think that's still the same value there so to keep the buildings and we, if we're going to go 2050 we want to go carbon neutral 80 percent of the building in 2050 then are already here today so yes. <laughs> all the new buildings is the 20 percent we're talking about circularity and, and taking the right material and embodied carbon and the 80 percent is what we're talking about is how can we dare make the right way not as much as possible? I'm always a fan of less tech, you know? I mean, high intelligence, but less tech. So we need less material because then we have less things we have to, to exchange always because the lifespans of all those technical stuff, I mean, is going down too. So it's uh, a good architecture means less technical stuff. So, and when we refurbish, we can rethink those things too. So probably sometimes it's better to go down a little bit with, with, with uh, complexity and technology. So this is one thought, which is very important. And the other is uh, uh, what looking, I have a straight look, what is the best thing to do? Sometimes it's, it's much better to keep a couple of years uh, uh, still the, the gas and the oil, but work first on the, on the, on the, on the insulation mm. instead of, changing just renewable and, and leaving the house and, and blowing out all the energy. So it, it, it's very important to look at those things from a, a, a economical viable standpoint and efficiency point. Uh, and I think industrialization and efficiency will have to enter this part of the market too. That's underestimated, I think. So we will see prefabricated facade elements you just put you add to the buildings without like touching the rest of the building for instance if it makes sense for a certain type of building you will see a total different way of 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 doing the work and logistics of of, of refurbishment we were working on a big project in switzerland where logistics was done by the post by the swiss post like by a logistic company okay because they had their storage and they knew exactly on what day, what material has to be on which door. And all the workers, they're, they're, they, what they can do is efficient doing the job and not transporting material and looking after this. So we are looking at total different processes, even in the refurbishment. This is very important that we have that in mind and use digital reality capture, digital twin of an existing building in the digital twin you go through the whole logistic, what's the most efficient way to do it, how much material we can leave. So it's very important to have to apply the same thinking, transparency from the beginning before you start with design and working. I mean, yeah, For, can can fully confirm Hubert. So I think bringing a prefab into renovation or into refurbishment, that is a key word. And uh, 
So good ideas around HVAC, around roofing, around windows. So that can all be more standardized. I think that's the problem today. So most uh, buildings are completely individual. So no building is as the other one. Uh, that's specifically true for Germany. And culturally, some other countries are slightly different. In the UK, for example, or in the Netherlands, you see more homogeneous stock uh, in a way. So I think standardization is a bit further. But if you even in, in, in difficult, let's say, house by house uh, situations in Germany, some elements for the workers, so you have more unskilled workers and not the most professional logistics, I think that needs standardization as well. And uh, then standardizing bathrooms, standardizing, say, insulation, the facade system, I think companies like Shuku and others are working on that yeah. and, and more integrated in a way and others as well, uh, glass uh, facades and all that. So I think there will be more flexible to re uh, have nice architecture, even in old buildings, perfect insulation, uh, perfect heating, perfect roofing, uh, perfect windows. So that's, that's all brought together and financed in a, say, subsidized. Uh, I think that will drive yeah. this 50% stock we see um, or even higher. So new build is, is declining. I think the new build share is... Uh, declining further as as we want to keep our stock and to keep our buildings as least at least as for 80 100 years whatever and then of course there, there is always a certain share in new builds that uh, will then uh, be different as well Who i just want to jump in one, one, one sentence <laughs> because if you have those diverse buildings you still have if you have intelligent reality capture you can really bring that into prefabrication of different even different sizes of windows because yep. the process is like you get the data out of the existing building and you prefab like even different type of windows. If you have the right prefabrication, you can do it in, in just in sequence. So this is this is something which will change a lot because otherwise we will never meet those demands we get. Yeah. I think that's that's what, what's uh, interesting. I think, I think renovation. Go ahead. Please, Puyo. Oh, yeah. uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I think that, that I was saying like okay, going back. Uh, sorry, Bjorn. Uh, renovation become a dirty word when it become repair because that's become kind of piecemealing and rather than looking forward and fixing a building for the future, you're just fixing it for now or the past. And then that's actually the majority of problem with the renovation is that a lot of architect contractors and even owners they see it in, uh, as a kind of small repairs. Uh, rather than looking at how we can kind of design a building and refurbish it for a kind of standing another 50 years or even more. Uh, and as a result, like we see kind of uh, rather than seeing the building in series of layers and system, we we constantly going repairing, repairing and infrastructure to the point that it's become unrepairable. Uh, and that's been happening in North America, especially for infrastructure. Uh, to the point, because, uh, rather than spending and um, holistically for 10 years, we spending for a, a year. The majority of municipals in North America that have the maintenance budget, and it's very small, and it's considered like changing the kind of couple window sills, couple of uh, kind of roof eave drops, rather than holistically looking at how we can refurbish this building or infrastructure for another 30 years. And as a result, it's money that goes to waste um, and the building reached to the point that basically become uh, unrepairable. And we have a lot of them, a lot of concrete blocks in North America that they reach in that, that time uh, to the point that actually you cannot repair it. You have to kind of uh, uh, change yeah. it. Well, Sorry. we have a great tradition here in Europe as well. When I think about some of the buildings that were constructed in the 60s and 70s, especially within the public housing, living in Vienna, and I look at the quality of these buildings and realize you're better off just blowing the thing up and starting from scratch. But I don't want to go ahead and dwell on that too much because we have a question coming from the audience. Prax, uh, Alexandra, if you can go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you. This is coming from Anita Navi Naiva, uh, and she is saying, uh, has any of the participants already implemented a business, sorry, a building uh, information management based digital solution for the circular economy. Any comments from our panelists? I mean, we have a beta version running on our Cree platform out of our BIM models. 
So we have all the data and we already play around and, and, and find out what what additional information makes sense and how we can automatically connect that with reliable sources like the Wuppertal Institute or whatever. So we have access to the, to the absolute uh, right databases to feed that in. So that's something we're working on. But there will be good solutions out there, at least uh, I, I expect in one year, because all the big, the, big, the big software companies have to work on this. I mean, I, I don't think that Revit will not provide their users with something like this because otherwise we will do that. And I think we're not as pos as powerful as Revit, you know, so they will not wait for us. And I, I can confirm, I mean, as every BIM project starts with a, a strategy consultant typically, so they're not just software firms, so I can confirm that most of our suppliers are really in BIM already since since five, six years, not just for the public UK tenders, uh, but also, let's say, all companies are driving uh, this. Uh, also with the big, uh, let's say, strategic projects also, uh, they are always at the beginning, uh, and most are in the implementation phase already, so it's it's now has become software pieces with software consultants, and uh, I certainly expect this kind of BIM share rise like we have seen in, in other countries, so uh, again, the UK is pretty advanced here, so if, if you see the the BIM share of projects, it's it's just uh, I'd say incredible, and uh, I think some some latecomer countries are always there, uh, Germany being one of them. But um, that is something you cannot stop uh, in a way, and it has been implemented several times. I think the the real example, the real life example, circular basically means also including let's say um, older buildings here. So I have. I think the, the circle is not yet uh, complete, but uh, I think it's a question of time and uh, projects are implemented. I think everyone has implemented or at least seen highly interesting projects here. I think it's it's a question of five, six, seven years and then we'll, we'll see them all up and running. And who, I think the problem is for those... In, in them. So, so those thinking BIM is not important, I think that that is uh, really dangerous in a way. So uh, it's hugely important. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Puya. Or Puya. I, I, in North America, I think the majority of engineering and designers are in BIM, but the problems, the, the circle gets disconnected when it goes to implementation as a ma majority of construction companies. Uh, they're still working in traditional, like a 2D PDF uh, submission and tender set. Um, so you're building this kind of highly sophisticated kind of 3D uh, mm -hmm. model, and you have to kind of reduce it to series of architect traditional architecture set of 2D drawings to put it in the public for tender. So the, there is a huge disconnect there, um, no matter how you invest on your BEM. Um, the majority of public and private projects go to the this tender set uh, and get chopped out. So the, uh, that's, I think that's a kind of, uh, it, it should be a kind of a future with like figuring out how this could be the whole project. When we talk about digital twin, should start with digital twin, should finish with digital twin, and digital twin actually should get become part of the building a, and age with the building. So. You can do the kind of, as we said, in, uh, renovation and everything. That digital twin is constantly updated. Mm -hmm. Puya, you al alluded to another problem that we have, and I think partially if we look at the maturity of the construction industry that uh, – we're, we're following processes that have been around for a long time. And uh, for me, it's, it's a case of where right doesn't necessarily know what left is doing. And so it's a really a question of all the stakeholders involved in the prox process. And I know, Alexa, that you are dealing spe specifically with this idea of awareness, instruction, and incentives. So perhaps if you can talk to us a little bit about what you're doing in that sector. Well, well some thoughts also f um, to, to the question before. So I often sure, have a problem course. thinking about um, buildings and circular economy because a building is immobile. It's it's not mobile. So, um, and our our aspect or our focus is, is lying on having a long lifetime long using phase. And we are talking today um, about resources and materials that we need and, and, and secondary material use and so on and so on. But um, what is what material do we need in 150 years? 
How many construction materials do we need in 150 years? How, um, how is the technology for recycling of special materials? So everybody who has seen um, TV Star Trek knows that in 24 years, the warp entry, the, the warp will be, will be, uh, yeah, um, implemented in, in humans world. Yeah. So what kind of technologies do we have? And, and this is, this is a big question when we're talking about construction industry, buildings and circular economy. So it, it's voodoo. Everybody who's talking to me about that, what is, what is happening in 150 years? Yeah. It's, it's nice. It's, it's nice vision. Maybe he has to go to the dark with a vision. Yeah. Um, but, but it's not reality. We don't know that. We do not have any idea what will happen then. So. Circular economy is, is quite nice, um, for, for other products like, uh, plastic cups, like, uh, laptops, like cars, for example, fridge or anything else. Therefore, circular economy is pretty good because we know now the technology we have when these products come back to the, um, come, come at the end of their lifetime. And this is also, uh, one, one, uh, big problem or a critic, crit, uh, critical point I have, um, uh, if we, if we, to, um, if we working with life cycle assessments and giving bonus points for the CO2 of the recycling of a building in 115 years. And I think this is, um, bullshit. Sorry. Because, uh, any CO2, that is now coming into the atmosphere stays there for minutes, tens, for minutes, 150 years. And it's absolutely dramatically, if I, if I, um, try to make the balance, the balances, the, the eco balances nicer. Yeah. With giving plus points for a, a recycling that, yeah, takes place in maybe 150 years. This is my, my big problem. And in, in our certification system, we, we stop after we, we are calculating the whole GVP uh, potential of, of the whole material production side of the construction of the building lifetime. But we calculated 50, sometimes 50 years, sometimes 100 years. But then the end of the lifetime is the end of the calculation. So there are no benefits at all. And I think that is real. Yeah. Mm. And that, that may, that is a big difference. So circular economy and, and construction industry, uh, uh, no construction industry. Yes. But buildings that doesn't fit in my eyes. Therefore, I, I see, resource efficiency I, I see that the, the, the panelists progress. are waiting to answer your question here, Alexa. Apologies. Puna, you want to go ahead and give it a step? Oh, uh, Hubert wants it. Okay, Hubert, sorry, apologies. Okay, um, yes, I, I totally agree. First of all, I agree to this uh, uh, to this uh, look at, at, at our industry as a whole and as the time frame. So, um, because circular is 8% today circular in the world, 8%. We are able to have 8% circularity with all the, the, the things we do already today. If we can double that and with a lot of other products to have a, a, a faster effect, like Alexa said, with short living products, it's more important at the moment. If we double that to 16, we would save 30% carbon, 30%, just to double the circularity from eight to 16. So it's a very important issue, the circularity issue. In terms of construction, it's just a responsibility to build in a way that things can separate it easily and it can come back easily, not knowing exactly what material then can be done, whatever. So that's the minimum responsibility we have and we should not count it into the carbon. I totally agree because that, that, that makes, brings different, that makes other bad things good for nothing, okay? But very important is in between that the, the material and the embodied carbon is counted. And we have a discussion at the moment in terms of the Green Deal, the ESG rules, you know, the whole lobbies, because they're not, they don't know what that's all about. I mean, it's just a lack of knowledge somehow, all the developers and the investors. Now they try to get, leave that out still. I mean, this is just insane if you can just produce cement, concrete, whatever yeah. into a building and you don't count it. So that's that's the most important thing. Less material 
and and the right material with a low carbon impact and resource use and make it circular but not counting in the circular this is very important for me to have this uh, to to have this uh, this clear and one more thing is we are looking from two sides because we are very much in the railway business railway operation building new railways too that's part of our business besides uh, building like green buildings so we are there bim is coming from the operational they want to they want to have bim in operations they want to know in real time what's happening with the whole digital infrastructure at the moment they come from that in, 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 in normal construction, they are coming from the design and try to go through what we do is to really use data and the BIM model for the construction and logistic itself and real time managing. So we go through the whole value chain because before you were talking about so many stakeholders and not going further. So we at Cree, it's much easier for us because we know exactly in advance what type of material, when and what, so we can go through that whole process with the model, with all the circular things. And that's something why I believe we can go a little bit faster than the whole industry. And that will probably then go to the side. That's I mm -hmm. just wanted to add to the question before, sorry. Yeah, just 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 one small sentence, screw instead of glue. I think that makes it brings it on the point, Hubert. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of like the word that you use otherwise to go ahead and describe the situation earlier, Alexa, but perhaps if we can give Bjorn and uh, Puna a chance here. Uh, any thoughts from you two gentlemen? I, th I think also the, the usage of a building, I think in an 80 years time frame, I think that the building is just uh, this one, two years and, and that's it. So the, the 78 years of, of usage of the building and that's Hubert where I think tech still comes into game. You said the less technology, the better. So, but I think the, um, especially in the, the existing building stock uh, using technology in yeah. terms of uh, making buildings more not just insulated, but also used more effectively. And uh, let's say steering of uh, basically the whole building automation is a technology that really allows to drive, drive down the, the, the carbon footprint on a, on a yearly uh, basis. I think circular, I fully agree to what has been said uh, before. So in, in this kind of long time frames, I mean, circular is theoretical for all of us. But let's say more effective and efficient usage of, of the building and, and driving down simply the yearly carbon footprint. I think that is so easy to reach in most buildings. I mean, it's it's just uh, it's it's coming from a such such a low level of, of efficiency on that end. So there there can be can be reached so much simply using very simple technologies. It's not it's not high tech. It's it's simply lighting, uh, HVAC, uh, vent ventilation, uh, of course, heating and, and cooling is the main uh, the main usage for buildings, but even lighting. So they can be done so much using simple, let's say building, building automation techniques. Uh, I think that is probably what drives us into a more circular thinking. But uh, let's say turning around the full building, that is something still theoretical, but uh, uh, when the when carbon gets a price, that will will make it much easier, actually. So that, that's where, where it turns into costs at the end. We have a very good example tied to lighting. This is something that Philips has been doing for a number of years, performing lighting as a service uh, with the intention is that you're actually not yeah. going ahead and buying the, the lighting uh products per se, but you're you're looking for a service. And so they've I know that they've been moving in that direction. I think that um, we will have much more continuing yeah, in that way. There, there is more as a service. There is security. Yeah. There is, uh, I mean, heating contracting is, is already existing. I mean, culturally, it's it's more existing in the UK. But I think growth rates also here uh, rise. And uh, I think security will be another service. I mean, it's not linked to, to carbon, of course, but uh, also a wish, a strong demand for security uh, going forward. So that's that's all. We'll see much more that kind of mod models, uh, let's say business models, where you earn for a service or an application rather than a product, a simple product mm -hmm. installed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, if you wanted to jump in here. Yeah, Puni, I wanted to give you a chance. Sorry, a um, couple of things I want to add uh, uh, about uh, beyond about the kind of uh, change. We keep talking about right now material, uh, circular material. I think one of the things as an architect I think is very important is fun, uh, is programming too. Um, if you look at any mid-rise or residential, uh, the uh, the 
the parking underground parking is the kind of the you use a lot of concrete which is bad for environment uh it's a, it's not a nice place and as the way we're going with the car sharing and the kind of new culture especially in very dense urban environment we see kind of new millennium don't use car you don't own car more and more we are finding so you will find out you spend 50 percent of the initial budget to building a kind of uh, an underground parking that is going it's made of concrete uh costs a lot of time and it actually costs a lot of time to do it there is no way you can prefab it you have to dig the ground um that in 10 or 20 years is going to be wasted uh waste of space as the people not going to use it and you cannot even retrofit it because there's no natural light so as an arc uh but unfortunately there's still a kind of law for the planning that you have to provide underground parking so what so as an architect we are always like how we can kind of design a space that doesn't gonna go uh wasted and uh, similar way that you design in a material that's not going to go wasted and then another thing i think uh, uh we were thinking i think uh this idea of the life cycle cost thing is very important in that government uh especially for government-based projects rather than have the initial costing or hard costing that's become a kind of uh, a, a part of the procurement and you uh, you design based on that and you hire the contractor you should look at the life cycle cost and make it a kind of as a as a kind of base of your procurement and the contracts and uh, that gives incentive to designer architect contractor and design in a way that actually they can reduce operation maintenance of building because you want to kind of reduce the overall cost of building for 50 years rather than build cheap for the this year or next year and i think majority of affordable housing that right now happening this new wave happening in uh, toronto because we have a huge shortage of uh, affordable housing the government just passed the kind of uh huge initiative to build the ra uh, rapid module housing but the whole purpose of that how we can build fast and cheap not thinking that we're going to kind of repeat what in the 60s and building these Mm -hmm. Oops, I think we just lost you, Puya. <laughs> the, the lips are moving, but we hear no sound. Still not. Yep. If someone would, uh, of, of us could be could lip reading, you know, we could like uh, proceed. <laughs> well, who but I've been working on that for a number of years, but I still haven't quite mastered it. Uh, perhaps <laughs> maybe uh, to just checking the time. If anybody has any other questions from the audience, would like to go ahead and and add. Uh, please feel free. Otherwise, I would like to go ahead and piggyback on something we just lost, Puna. Uh, but there was something I saw within the Bauhaus Museum yesterday here in Deso, and they talked about a concept that I had never heard of before, and perhaps maybe some of you have. It was called uh, the Volkswohnung. So for those who are not speaking German, uh, the, the people's apartment. And the idea there was not to come up with something that's cheap, but it would be something that would be functional. So, in other words, we do uh, we do not add or ornateness to just to be ornate, but rather we are using it for a certain purpose. And I think the real question is, and this piggybacks on a lot of the things that that I've heard so far, doesn't mean it has to be ugly. I'd, it has to be functional, and it has to be practical and usable for people. So how do we go ahead and bring these worlds together where it is affordable and usable and realizes valuable for everybody at the same time as working closer to our goals? Any thoughts from the three of you? I mean, uh, I've, I've, uh, I think this uh, notion of Volks, Volkswohnung or, uh, is, is really an old one, but uh, I've remembered this word when, when seeing some uh, some of the projects out there, uh, let's say, student homes being built. I think that is uh, always a uh, need to be, let's say, relatively low cost. And uh, I've seen companies installing, let's say, 100 bathrooms in a, in a big hall where basically 100 bathrooms have been pre-installed, uh, let's say, Dichtigkeits um, uh, checks. So that they basically did all the, the professional checks uh, in, uh, in a nice temperature 
there was freezing and, and snow, and I've just seen 100 bathrooms in a row that have been basically then uh, transported in a very professional, let's say, one week uh, to the construction site and being installed in this student home, 150 flats I've, I've seen. So, and, and I think they are well-designed, well-planned, and there, there was even the possibility to have individual design and, and color uh, colors you can choose here and there. So, so that project I've just observed uh, last year, and I thought there must be much, much, let's say, many more elements like just a bathroom. Uh, so, I think it's uh, it's it's even more. I mean, you can think of the kitchen, uh, but but even let's say the uh, uh, even even more elements. So, home automation, building automation, this all needs to be standardized. Again, I think the efficiency thinking. So, let's install as many let's say high let's say high quality and, and medium to low price uh, let's say ideas into buildings that is just fantastic and this can also happen in in renovation situations where you just refurbish let's say 100 100 uh, flats uh, in a row so so that made me at least think of of this old notion of volkswohnung um, mm -hmm. And also good design and good functionality is so easy to implement in that case, but it needs some some pre thinkers uh, that, that do that. So some, let's say, of course, you need different installers who are able to do that, and even even the suppliers need to 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 participate in that game. So I think it's it's impossible to to change to change this whole game only on the contractor side. So big contractors, of course, can can do that and drive this. But I think even if you think of heating units, they, they need to implement many more elements, uh, let's say, in, in this one big bo uh, uh, box, actually. So I think also installers need to, to rethink their components and rather produce systems. I, I think that is, that is coming. Uh, I think in the core, it's the architects, uh, Puya, and the planners that, that simply need to be open to those ideas. I mean, otherwise... Suppliers can offer many things as long as it's not it's, it's not asked for and as long as there is no demand. So I think the, the question is where who is the first, let's say, chain or the first element in this chain who really needs to change? And I think that's uh, it's probably more the investors and the planners and the architects rather than anyone else. I think uh, um, I think the suppliers are just supplying what's what's asked for. <laughs> so. Uh, I think the driver in that, that change is somebody else. It's the investor and the the planners. At least that's my hypothesis, Alex. I'm not sure you're you're agreeing or whether you have others that need to be educated first. Uh, of course, the uh, certification players are also important in that game. But uh, the question is, who's really driving first? Who's who has to move first, and who has moved already, and who is still doing the same. I think most of the contractors they are quite traditional in, in my experience. So if you try to change that kind of bathroom or HVAC thinking, it takes um, quite a while because educating 50,000 HVAC installers out there is just quite difficult. So you need to have those lighthouse players in there who really benefit by by moving, by changing things. Hubert, you yeah, <laughs> I just want to add when we talk about affordable living, yeah, and this is mm -hmm. also a little bit about we as mostly technical people, or at least most of us, <laughs> um, have to think differently. You know, we always think, oh, that means price not higher as, for instance, but it depends on your income. So we are working on on, on a product that's called Home Thirty Five. You pay thirty five percent of your income. So then you find out what type of mix in a certain area or in a building I need that it works for the investor. Okay, so it's, it's, it's coming from, from a different side. And then you ask, who's taking the biggest margin, the biggest chunk out of the whole value chain? And then you, you, you find out the biggest chunk of the value chain is by the developer, 10 to 15 percent. Okay. The general contractor takes probably two or four, whatever, high risk, no margin. The suppliers, the bit lowest bidder, whatever, it's just low, 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 bad material, cheap, 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 okay? But at the first, no one looks at the 10 to 15%. That's what we have to address, different ways of development. Uh, if we have intelligent generative design with prefab elements, we can use existing land, 
and really be much faster in developing without using and needing a developer. Problem developer doesn't like, don't like that hearing now, but it's always when there's disruption in the industry, it, the bites will always go, <laughs> the Pac-Man goes where the big margin is, okay? Yeah. And that's something we will probably see. And there's a good study done by, by I think, McKinsey, I don't know, and or, or, or was it EY? I don't know, so probably Bjorn knows that better. <laughs> where the margin are at the moment and where in future the margin will go. And this is a really a great chart because everyone in the industry can look to himself where I am at the moment and where do we have to move if I want to if I want to survive and that helps a lot in terms of better processes and 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 more efficiency without having to pay non uh, value generating people okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sure. Uh, Alexa Puya, please. Um, <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we are focusing on another uh, on another idea. So we are creating now some benchmarks like um, return on climate investment and return on material investment. Um, and I think um, um, yeah, all the investors need need these benchmarks um, and need this data, and we can create it out of our resource course. Um, and I think we got the um, yeah we got the race um, when when these benchmarks are uh, maybe in a, in a few years um, uh, influencing the building value on the market. And I think this is also a, a big issue, and, and there we are still working on. Mm -hmm. Puya, how about from your side? Anything you'd like to go ahead and add? Um, I'm just going to echo Hobart when he said uh, that was McKenzie report, basically, when it's talked about the, how, the, uh, how the construction industry can be changed. And I think one of the base was like if, if the uh, business model goes from the project to product, then, then as you see, a designer and an architect would work directly rather than under the contractor. They can be at the same time develop the idea, find the land and work with the manufacturers. That yeah. produce the product directly and using the offsite, and majority of work that done on site would happen off offsite in the factories. That means you have less people on site, less need a general contractor. And if you look at it, uh, majority of general contractors act as a site superintendent. Uh, you have the kind of one site superintendent that works from the concrete to all the way to finish it to millwork. Versus if you see the kind of architecture and uh, construction series of layers, you can work with a kind of series of different specialized contract and install it that they come as the building develop up uh, mm -hmm. and reduce the cost. And this is kind of the affordable housing. I think we have a bad thing in North America, especially Canada. We, we say good design is expensive. This is actually opposite. The good design is efficient. Mm -hmm. mean save money. And um, and when it comes to affordable housing, we don't need cheap contracted cheap material. We need good design, mess under good design, design building that can be modified, can be refurbished, can be kind of last forever. And I think that's kind of misunderstanding in North America, which the way you can actually win all these RFP is by having the lowest fee. Uh, so I think we should change that. The government should. Uh, change that this kind of system of the whoever has the lowest fee for design can win the construction and uh, I think the ne next generation would be architect would work directly with manufactured rather than the GCs. I think we almost need a separate live stream for that subject alone there Puya. I'd like to go ahead and display one last comment that came out from our audience. Thank you very much uh, Alexander. This is calling, coming from Colleen where she states and this is a great segue to that Puya what you were talking about it's so interesting to hear about a European approach to building and so hard to see how to implement those lessons now in North American building culture based on the lowest builder uh, lowest bidder so in fact without even realizing you were completely in telepathy with Colleen so thank you very much um, <laughs> uh, we are reaching the end 
of our live stream. So I'd like to give all of the panels an opportunity to pose last words, and then we'll go ahead and close the session. So perhaps, Bjorn, if you can start with you. Yeah, I, I think we'll we'll see much, see and hear much more of that topic uh, going forward. So I'm not worried about legal frameworks to change. Even the US, I think, to just address this question, I think, <coughs> um, has been a time of of uh, other questions in the US. But I think we'll we'll see more here, and also the efficiency thing and the funding thing will clearly make us talk more often about. Uh, about this uh, uh, cool topic. So uh, thanks for having us. And sure. We, Thank we you. Uh, Puya, how about from your side? One, one hour. <laughs> oh, sorry. Apologies. Uh, Puya. Um, I just want to thank everyone. I, I think that when you talk about, uh, I've been thinking, uh, talking to you guys, the, the first startup circle econ economy is it's, uh, it's not about material, it's actually the way we're doing the business. And as I said, we, we see ourselves as a platform. And that's what kind of very interesting work we kind of seeing the Cree. It's about sharing knowledge and being a kind of working as a team to build a building. Uh, as it's kind of, I think, the first step that is seeing a building uh, as a different way uh, rather than, oh, we have prime consultant, sub consultant, engineer, Rick, versus seeing it as a team and kind of de develop that and see it as a business model that different firms around the world can collaborate, come with a system product that, and policy making all of these together. I think we can start with the change in the way we're doing the business. That would affect how we build. Excellent, Puya, thank you very much. Alexa, how about you? Well, I think we need to, um, yeah, we need to talk and to educate all stakeholders. It, it starts with, uh, with um, uh, in the study courses of architects and, and uh, developers. Um, we have to make clear um, um, all the suppliers, what kind of materials uh, do we use? What is in these materials um, included um, on, on negative uh, um, impacts? Um, we have to we have to talk to the investors. We have to show them that uh, resource efficient construction brings high value buildings that that are really be sellable on the market. Um, I think these are the points we, we we really have to talk to to the people. Otherwise, we will not um, get the change. And we need um, yeah people like Hubert because he's still built these buildings that are the examples we, are, we, we need. Mm -hmm. And the man of the hour, Hubert, oh, you are the stopper nice. for our <laughs> live stream today. No. So perhaps if you could share some last words, please. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, that the, relating to the question about the lowest, the culture of lowest bidder, this is one very important thing. And we've heard about the process. What we see is to have this transparency, to have a sustainable building in a digital twin with all the information. And then we save so much money in the process as having tenders, uh, 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 working on those tenders and, 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 and pushing people and, and, and hitting people. So it's, it, there will be probably no more tenders because demand will be so high and there will not enough supply from, from companies, from people, from materials. So why work on... Uh, on having this lowest bidder, just decide from the beginning whom you want to work with in your team, what type of material is in the building, and then work with that team till the end and not having this break. So this is a very efficient process and it's much more coming from the heart working together and not using 50% of the time fighting with, with each other about contracts and whatever. We need engineers working together producing great buildings and not fighting with each other. So that's a little bit the mindset thing I want to share with you guys at the end. And that's what we is. <laughs> and, and I think uh, that clearly we we talk about price in in an RFI or an RFP, but we really don't talk about the total total cost of ownership. But again, I think that's probably something to be covered in a completely different live stream. Thank you very much to the panelists. Thanks for all of you for joining. And I'd like to go ahead and announce our next live stream and that will be our our cree talk about timber hybrid systems and that will be on the 24th of august at 4 p.m central european time and it will be announced uh, very shortly within LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, so be watching out for that. And within that live stream, we have a panel discussion together with Edge Technologies and we'll be covering timber hybrid systems. Um, 
performing the comparison and the like. And so again, that will be on the 24th of August at 4 p.m. And so please go ahead and look out for that. Again, thanks for everybody for joining. Thanks for our panelists and look forward to seeing you the next time. So have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Uh, bye.